I'm Tim Merrill, founder and CEO of iTouch Reality, which is a mobile social consumer VR and AR um, software platform, and DigiCapital, the sell side and buy side M&A advice for AR and VR. Um, I'm a software engineer, investment banker, and lawyer, um, so I've got one honest profession. VR, AR, and mixed reality are the fourth wave of consumer technology. So it started off with PC, then into internet, mobile, and now into the real different ways of reality. Um, one of the things to look at when you're looking at that sort of platform change and those sorts of waves is they're not straight. Growth isn't, isn't, doesn't look like that, it's curved. And the thing to look for are the inflection points. When, do, when does the wave start breaking? Now with PC, it took about 20 years from the launch of the Apple II until the market really started to ramp very, very quickly. With broadband internet, it took about five years. With mobile, it took about three years from when the iPhone launched for the market to really hit its inflection point. And the thing with AR, VR, and MR is that it's not a single wave, it's three waves. And so you've got to look at it in, those, in that context. One last thing in relation to this is that if you look at the way that tech markets develop, um, we're in the first of what are basically four stages of tech market development which seems to be pretty consistent. There's hype cycle, which we're in the middle of right now. There's facing reality when folks start pushing back and underestimate the long-term potential. There's lift off when it really does hit that inflection point and grow a sustainable market. So VR and AR are, on the face of them, very similar. You know, they've both got wonderful stereo optics, spatial audio, all sorts of things. But if, um, if VR is this, AR is this. So with VR, you're basically placing, so placing the user inside a virtual world, immersing them. With AR, you're placing virtual objects in the user's real world, augmenting it. So very, very different. And when you think about where you use those two sorts of platforms, VR you use in stable environments, so home, train, office, places where you're not going to get hit by a passing truck because you haven't got any vision outside of the headset. AR you can use pretty much anywhere. So then there's a HoloLens on the International Space Station, so it's, it's fairly mobile in terms of platform. If you think about the user base and what those limitations and, and also uh, opportunities mean, for VR, it's a market that will be in the tens of millions of users. So if you think of console in terms of scale, probably not a bad analogy. With AR, in the very long run, it'll end up replacing the smartphone in your pocket. So a market with hundreds of millions and then longer term up from there. So the two markets have complementary addressable, mar addressable markets. There are different things you do with them. The shorthand for this is that VR is basically entertainment plus apps, and AR is apps plus entertainment. So VR, very much entertainment-led, so it's games, which you're all here for, video, and then a range of non-entertainment uses, military, medical, education, a whole range of things. AR will look more like, in the long run, the way the smartphone ecosystem looks today. So e-commerce, data and voice, um, video, enterprise uses across the piece, advertising when the market gets to scale, and then consumer apps from Facebook to Uber to Clash of Clans and theme parks. So different markets, different sorts of applications. But mo the one thing that's consistent about both markets is that mobility will drive installed base. So when you think about VR, it's all about price. In other words, mobile VR is from $99 down to free, and free is a pretty good price point. With AR, it's inherently a mobile platform. It's all about mobility. So again, mobility is the key to everything. Now that red line that you see up there is the smartphone and tablet installed base. And what you'll notice is even though we're talking about a very high growth for VR, AR, and MR, when you're comparing it to the smartphone and tablet install base, you're, you're, you're comparing a few hundred million headsets in five years' time to what well, by that time will be over six billion devices. So around 5% of the total market. So very high growth, but it might take years more for AR and VR to actually pass and cannibalize the smartphone and tablet market fully. So what does that mean for revenue? When you look at what's happening right now, the consumer market's VR, and that will be the consumer market in the main for the next couple of years. Um, so if you are focused from a games perspective on where you're gonna try and make money out of this market, VR is the place to focus right now. Longer term, what we expect is around 2018, and it could take longer, if, if, but if, if the roadmaps that we're seeing are correct, you'll get that magical combination of hero device, long battery life, cellular communication, um, an app ecosystem that starts to look like the early mobile app ecosystem in terms of breadth and telco cross-subsidization 
So basically, AR will become as easy to use, as accessible as the smartphone in your pocket today. And again, you can see the different ranges of the different types of sectors you'll get in both markets. But then when you think about business models, and I think that's where it comes back to the games market and, and what that looks like for you guys, um, over 80% of the market from a business model perspective will be in hardware, um, advertising, e-commerce, and mobile network data and voice. So when it comes to games, combining VR and AR games in total, we're anticipating around the 10 billion mark uh, in revenue terms in five years' time. So good big market, but needs to be put into perspective when you think that the mobile games market is over $30 billion this year. In terms of the overall landscape, and this is you know, a snapshot of where things are today, um, it's already a very busy market. There are lots of different companies across the piece, and that's only growing. The interesting thing is that nobody's really dominant today. When you look at the, even when you look at the existing platforms, whether it be you know, Sony, HTC, Vive, um, Oculus in the PC VR space, but, and console big VR space, uh, even there, there's no clear dominance yet. Now, that may emerge in the next year or so, but right now, even at that level, where you've got big players with a lot of money behind it, it's all to play for. When you move into the software layer, it's even broader. Nobody's dominant yet, and nobody's likely to be dominant for the next year or so. So if you're a developer now, and if you're a developer and you have a way to survive through the next 18, 24 months as the market scales, whether that be because you've raised a round, whether that be because you've got a way of doing project work, whether it be because you're coming from a different space and you're adding it onto your existing business, now's the right time to be developing because now's the time to actually try and carve out a unique space in the market. VCs have not been ignorant of what's going on. Um, there's been a record $2 billion invested in VR and AR um, globally in the last 12 months. Um, and what you'll see here is that a big chunk of that went into Magic Leap, uh, around $794 million in the most recent round. If you're in the consumer space, as most games companies are, AR and mixed reality, it's probably a little early for you to be able to make a lot of money there. But if that's where you're committed to long term and you are really able to make it to the long term, then that will be an interesting space for, for developers as well. Uh, and so it really depends on what you're doing, what your time horizon is, and, and what your resources are. So when we then look at the technology itself, uh, what we see is that there's a lot of progress that's been made. Now, these benchmarks come from all the entire market. This isn't in one magical device. If it was, that would be the dominant player. Um, but when you look at the different devices, what you'll see is they've all got different constraints, whether it be positional tracking in terms of the size of, of the space you can be in, or the latency that's involved, or if it's mobile VR, you know, some of the limitations around that. If it's things like switching between AR and VR. If you, if you, again, if you look at what's just happened with Pokemon Go in the last week, you can see how using a very basic device, um, which doesn't have a lot of the fancy uh, uh, actual sensors built into it, you can obviously achieve great things. So how do you deal with that sort of thing? So a lot of limitations around the VR side, but a lot of progress. And again, around the AR side, it's the same thing. AR, the technical questions are actually much harder to solve. And that's part of the reason why AR is focused predominantly on the enterprise market right now. Uh, and not on the consumer market so much yet. But again, you can see already, look at, say, field of view. With Meta, they've achieved 90 degrees already. Now, that's PC-based, so it's not a truly mobile solution. But even so, the optics they've been able to make work. Or look at, say, ODG, where the resolution that they're actually delivering is extraordinary. You know, it, it's absolutely pin-sharp with something that's this close to your eyes. So again, a lot of progress, but also some limitations. And that's really where I'm going to try and finish up before I open to questions. There are a lot of hardware constraints. They exist. And you know, right now, we're in version one of the market. So you can either rail against those and say, oh, you know, if we had these sensors, if we had that positional tracking, if we had this resolution, it's not the way to think about it. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, Tommy Palm's a friend. Um, he developed Candy Crush. Um, and he left, uh, uh, left King to form Resolution Games, a VR games company. And the, f the very first game that they released, which was very basic, was Solitaire. You know, it doesn't get much more basic a game than Solitaire. But Tommy had a problem. Um, he needed to have a button to reset the deck. Now, in VR, the one thing you don't want to do is take away from immersion. So if you've got a button hanging in midair, that doesn't look very good. So his solution was a very simple and elegant one. First off, he was on Gear VR, and he didn't want to use the trackpad on the side because he thought, well, people's arms are going to get tired, which is 
true that it does that it does happen he wanted to use gays so you look at a, a card for a very short piece of time it selects the card but still the button problem so the way that he solved it was really elegant um, and a design solution he set the game in an old library and in the old library there's an oak desk and on the oak desk there's a button so it's still a button but it fits into the environment it doesn't take away from the immersion gaze at the button deck resets so as you're thinking as developers about how you attack this market, what you do, use the constraints that are there from the hardware perspective to actually design really great things. If you look at things like Tilt Brush, which I think of all the VR applications I've used is my favorite by far, you know, it's really simple, but very elegant. You couldn't do that in anything other than VR. It simply wouldn't be the same experience. And look at a whole range of what's being done now across the piece in games, in the social space, more broadly in, in terms of a whole range of, of the video space, a whole range of applications. So look at the constraints and use them to come up with inspiration for how you actually develop something which is not just another rehash of, uh, uh, of the existing sorts of games that you see on, on smartphones or console or PC. Do something that's really fresh, and then you might have a chance to break out. You know, again, looking at the success of Pokemon Go, I think everybody, including the people who developed it, have been amazed at the success that they've had. Now, is that the ultimate extension of what you can do within AR and VR? Of course not. But look at the device they were using. Look at the results they've achieved. So it's possible. Don't just stick with what you know. Use the new medium in a fundamentally new way. Thank you. Uh, I think if, if we've got quite time for a few questions, if anybody's got specific any. Specific lessons you think we should learn from Pokemon Go as a games industry, things to do or things not to uh, do? Uh, have an enormous brand helps. <laughs> um, and then um, have an enormous brand helps. <laughs> I, I think it's fairly simple if, if you're looking at it just with common sense. The Pokemon is, Pokemon is such a well-loved franchise. I mean, it just you know, how many people in here, in here have never played Pokemon at all? Not a single hand. That's all you really need to know. It's basically, it, it's, it's the market. So if you're aiming at a mass market, aim at a mass market. Now, there will be a huge slew of, of, of games and other applications that will now use that basic mechanic for a whole range of things. So I think the ones that will be successful will either be ones where they have a huge brand, where what they're doing is fundamentally delightful, in might even be using some existing approaches. You know, look at Slither.io. That was using a really well-loved um, uh, game mechanic, did really well from you know, a single developer. So it's either have it being very, very well-branded because it's coming from an existing franchise or something which is fundamentally novel for the user. You know, the fact that people have to wander around, well, that existed before but because it was attached to a big brand in a very simple way is great. The other, thing, other point I take from that is um, when the game came out, a whole bunch of folks said, well, this is really, really basic. You know, it's not a complex thing. It's, the gameplay is different. I don't like it. But think about the core user loop. On the iTouch reality side, whenever we look, are talking to the engineers, it's always, you know, it's, it's got to be simple. Take the friction out, make it simple. So if you're gonna do something that is using the the, the ideas behind Pokemon Go make the user loop ridiculously simple. You know, think of it as being VR for the lazy. That's what you want. Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? Hello. Uh, so there's a lot of um, wor a lot of t products, technologies out there that use the AR or VR moniker out there, and there's quite a breadth in there. So Pokemon Go is AR. Magic Leap is AR. Um, is there any kind of uh, risks uh, associated with the market adoption with so many different products using the same kind of terminology? I think there are two sides to it. Uh, I think the first, the terminology piece, um, I don't think it really matters, to be honest. Uh, I think VR, AR, MR, mobile VR, PC VR, console VR, it's all different. I, I, I think um, the challenge is more one of user experience. Um, where if it's a great experience for the user, then that will work. If it's a terrible experience for the user or it gets really bad press, that won't work. So look at Google Glass. You know, that, that product came out before it was ready. And I think it would be a fair thing to say that it put the perception of the market back by a couple of years. You know, it, it, was, it was a major fail. And I don't think anybody, Google included, would, 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 would dispute that. That's more of a concern. It, it's more give the users a bad experience uh, and it doesn't matter what you call it. Give the users a great experience, it doesn't matter what you call it. Um, so I think at the end of the day, in the next few years, um, what you're likely to see is more of a divergence of the tech. In other words, everybody's got a different approach. Um, if you talk to, well, as, as a developer as well, if you, if you talk to other developers, 
it's a both a huge challenge, but actually it's kind of interesting because you can pick your horses and, and, and back the, what you think will be the winners. From a hardware perspective, um, all the different hardware players have a different take on where the market's going, how they're going to dominate. The critical things for the market right now are awareness, which Pokemon Go helped with hugely. Call it whatever you like. That was fantastic. Is it um, what I think of as being you know, VR where you've got a headset on? No, it's not. Is it AR like that? No, it's not. But from a consumer perspective, oh, okay, I'm using an augmented reality app. Oh, this other augmented reality thing, I'll try it. So I think it, it gives a bit of awareness. I think that's useful. Um, from a long-term perspective, does that confuse people when Magic Leap comes out with, with its, its device or ODG or others? Uh, maybe, maybe it does. Um, but again, if the user experience is great, so we have, um, I think it's the HTC, HTC Vive, right? Yeah. And that's and that's a big sort of experience in someone's home. Are we going to get to a place where there's something like a holodeck? You know, like I know that's it's cliche, but like where you can be in VR with someone else without a headset, or is that too is that too like sci-fi? Um, there are all sorts of wonderful technology um, proof of concepts and prototypes that, that I've seen so far. I think my, my favorite one so far is I had somebody showing me um, a, a VR contact lens, um, which sounds fantastic because you, know, you think a contact lens, wonderful, but actually I think might be a technological dead end because you've got to have the lens, which has got a little, t the lens which has a tiny little lens on the center of it, then you have to wear glasses. So you've got to wear contact lenses and glasses to have the experience. So there are lots of, of really interesting technology aspects. You've got VR caves where it's a bit in the direction of what you're talking about, and that sort of thing's been around for a while. Um, the, I think in terms of the evolution of where the market's going, I don't think I know any more, any more than anybody else. The sort of area which becomes interesting is with mixed reality, where with some of the light field prototypes that I've seen, if, if that wonderful suit was on him in mixed reality, it would look real. I mean, it would look more real than it looks on him now. Um, th where basically, where you're placing what looks like a solid virtual object in the real world where it's tied to the real world and you can't tell that it's not, that it's not actually there. That sort of thing becomes interesting. Now, right now, that looks like glasses. So in terms of, of the current wave of where things are going, it looks like glasses. And that's where things like, say, that hero device, you know, you've got an elegant form factor. You know, even I'd say probably the of the different AR glasses right now, probably ODG's has the best form factor that I've seen because it's, it looks like a pair of 70s sunglasses with a heat sink on top. But they're, they're moving further beyond that. So the form factor is one aspect. Then you've got battery life. You know, it, it's, if, again, you need to be able to have it work most of the day because otherwise, well, you've got this thing in your pocket that does. It's got to be better than that. You need to have it being able to have cellular connectivity, so you've got a little radio in there that's not going to fry your eyeballs. Um, uh, and again, battery life. But then you come back to the, the two big ones, which are um, the app ecosystem. In other words, if it's purely games, it's not going to replace your smartphone. So it's got to be broader. And then what goes with that is the telco cross subsidization where you've got to have the telcos actually making it affordable. So that, again, the price is similar to smartphones. Put all those five things together, and then you get a mass market where wherever you go, if you want, You've got access to all the information, the games, the videos, whatever else it is you want to, want to do in the same way that you currently do, but in a way which you're actually evolved to do. In other words, we're not evolved to do this. You know, this isn't what we naturally do. We're evolved to look around and use our hands and everything else. So I think it's not so much about purely the visual. It's about the entire system and the applications that go with it. Great. Well, I think we're probably out of time. Um, but look, any more questions, just ask me down the back. Thank you very much.